morning, everyone. So we're talking about moderation today. I think, my, in my opinion, this is where all the fun begins. Um, we'll start with moderation today and then move into two sessions on mediation and then do our final session, which we'll, we'll decide on in session five what that's going to look like, what that's going to be. So today we'll start with just looking at categorical predictors, and then we'll move into moderation analysis and interpreting interaction effects and um, testing simple slopes, identifying regions of significance, et cetera. We're going to talk about this all in the context of the Hayes process macro. Um, so I'll get into more of that um, when we get there. Um, also, just to give you a heads up about some other stuff that I put in the week two um, site page, I added a chapter on regression diagnostics, and I also um, added a an some annotated output that Rachel was kind enough to provide um, to us. So you did, can you just talk a little bit about what you did, and then that kind of brings us into the moderation for today? Um, so I just was looking at um, the outcome was a treatment study for um, smoking cessation in college students. So the outcome was the percent of abstinent days during treatment. And I was looking at, um, trying to look at the effect of heavy drinking days on treatment um, outcome. So the variables were treatment or non, which is dichotomous variable. Um, and then I wanted to covary dependence. So I just wanted to um, I was just looking at my residuals and things, and Molly helped me see if they were like normal looking or what. So it was just my output with my some residual histograms and stuff. Yeah, and so that's in there with just some brief notes that I put into the output um, in terms of thinking about what it looks like. And it did seem to me like the most likely issue that was going on that was that if you added a moderator, you might get better explanation of the um, the two extremes of the the predicted y value. So that's what we're, we're hoping is going to happen by adding a moderator. It, has anyone else done um, some diagnostic work in following along with what we talked about last week? So using the syntax in the slides and seeing your residuals, which is always kind of like, oh, I actually don't want to know. <laughs> but no. Well. It's there for your um, your ana analytic pleasure. Um, so this is what we talked about last week. We talked about the fact that residuals plotted with the predicted y values. I mean, you can plot them in various ways, but we primarily talked about plotting standardized residuals against predicted y and using that to diagnose certain flaws to the model. And the the um, issues that we talked about was if were if the model was potentially a nonlinear association rather than a linear association, the presence of outliers or the presence, uh, presence of heteroscedasticity, so a violation of the homoscedasticity assumption. Then we went through elements of the output and just kind of crunched the numbers to get more comfortable with exactly what's going on um, with the calculation of the, the solution in the, in the regression equation. And we talked just a little bit about issues in multiple regression, about um, thinking about the importance of the stability of the model, which Ron was just talking about, just the idea of like, it is a good, it is a good idea to kind of play around with your models a little bit and in what we call sensitivity analysis, so changing certain things to see exactly how stable those, those findings are. Um, and also keeping it simple is always a good thing. And um, we, you know, you may choose certain data reduction methods, um, thinking about multicollinearity and the diagnostics for that, as well as um, different variable entry approaches, which we all kind of agreed were. Let's just stick to the, the standard approach and stay away from the more exploratory approaches, unless you have 10,000 cases. Um, so, working with categorical predictors and regression analysis. Regression analysis is very flexible with categorical predictors. Um, these types of data can represent single dichotomies, such as gender or multiple level categorical data, such as something like marital status. 
Um, the approach to coding is essentially that each research factor, say big G, um, classifies subjects into one of G groups where G is greater than one. So what that means is that to represent nominal data quantitatively, you would create and then code a set of G minus one variables that represent the different values of that categorical variable, like male versus female or um, marital, uh, divorce, you know, single, married, divorced, separated, etc. Um, so starting with the simple dichotomy, the dummy code, um, here we're going to assign a value of 0 to one group, the reference group, and a value of 1 to the group of interest. Um, generally, it's good, at least for me, I find it helpful um, to code, say, to code the variable in terms of the group that you're more interested in. So if you're interested, say, it's a, you're interested in the effect of um, whether women score higher than men on a certain value, you might code women as one, men as zero, and then call the variable female. So when you're interpreting those coefficients, there's not, you know, you're just reducing the confusion when at all possible. Another example might be naltrexone versus placebo on number of drinking days where naltrexone would be equal one and placebo equal zero. At this point, under that condition, um, the intercept and the regression equation with no covariance would be the mean predicted number of drinking days for the placebo group. So you have an interpreter, interpretable um, con uh, intercept for the equation. Um, and then the regression coefficient for the x variable, which is that dummy naltrexone variable, is the slope difference between the naltrexone and placebo condition, meaning how much the regression line will shift from the intercept due to naltrexone group membership. Okay? Make sense? So here's an example of a three group coding situation. Um, so just looking at this first, we can think about this as our, as our data set. So we've got six cases. Um, there's three conditions. The conditions are um, CBT, MI, CBT, and then C is assessment only. Assessment only is our reference group. You can see that's the group with all zeros coded. We've got those would be our, um, our series of predicted Y values, say, again, number of drinking days. And then these are our dummy variable codes. So we've got three conditions we've got, which gives us two dummy variables. And you can see for group A, CBTMI, you've got one, zero, zero, one, and then zero, zero, okay? And so then how that looks in the model is that here's our model here. And then for the, um, say, the dummy variable treatment, um, the equation becomes this, where you've got B times zero, and that's how it drops out of the equation, right? Similar with CBT here, you're multiplying, you've got the intercept plus B1 times zero, so that's the CBT MI condition plus the dummy, the WCBT here. And then for assessment only condition. So the con so then the substantive interpretation of that is the constant is the mean predicted y for the reference group, which is the group with all zeros and the dummy variable, right? In this case, that's assessment only. Um, the b coefficient for a group represents the deviation for that group coded with ones in the um, coded with ones for the variable um, from the group with zeros and all the dummy variables. So. In this case, we've got predicted Y when membership equals assessment. And then B1 is slope change when membership is CBTMI, slope change from assessment to CBTMI. And then B2 is slope change when CBT versus assessment. Make sense? Okay. So that's going on behind the scenes. You're not, co you're not coding these variables. Whatever statistical software package you're using will create those for you. Um, here's an example of effect coding. So say you're not interested in zero being the intercept. When you have dichotomous outcomes or dichotomous predictors, zero is often a meaningful value, right? Um, but maybe you want to put the intercept at the mean rather than at zero. 
So this is an example where you would use an effect coding um, step where you've got same three conditions, but this is an example of three different, say we're looking at the effect of um, therapist on outcome. So, um, so you've got therapist A, B, and C, predicted outcomes, you've got your one, zero, zero, one, and then negative one, negative one would be the codes there. And then the equations are here. And then you can see you've got the, the, a different, the difference here, which is the constant becomes the grand mean. So it's a sim essentially like centering, right? You're rescaling x, right? Because you're adding that additive constant, negative 1. And therefore, you're moving the intercept from 0 to the mean for the sample. So then in that example, you're able to um, say, you know, does this, does therapist A's, what is the effect of therapist A? in contrast to um, all therapists, the, the average for all therapists in the, in the sample. Make sense? Any questions? Does any, has anyone, does anyone use like effect coding? <clears throat> like does anyone stray from the, from the traditional dummy coding to like using different like effect coding or contrast coding methods? Very commonly done in fMRI. And it's done for what? So it codes like the effect of like doing the particular uh, task versus baseline. Uh huh. And you know, one condition of the task versus baseline, another condition of the task versus baseline, and the coding between the two tasks. Uh huh. It's done very, very commonly. That's how you're supposed to do it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I think it can give you really good um, specific information. Um, so here's an example of contrast coding. So where you would you would create specific contrast to tests, which I think with the fMRI you're talking about contrast coding. Um, so contrast coding, um, you you'll represent hypotheses by a set, a set of numbers called contrast weights. Um, the positive or negative sign of the weights is used to indicate which groups are going to be contrasted. So this is an example. This is the same as like the previous table, except that it's flipped, right? So here are our dummy code values or our contrast code values. And then we're, in this example, we're talking about um, stages of change, right? Pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, and action. And then this is our coding st scheme. We're still having our, um, here before it was the columns add to zero. Here we've got the um, rows because it's flipped are adding to zero here, here. And then B1, the B1 coefficient will test whether pre-contemplation differs from action. Whether uh, B2 is whether preparation will differ from action. And then B3 is going to test whether the combination of all of these stages of change differ from the action stage. And you could switch it around if you wanted, say, you wanted it to be uh, pre-contemplation to be what you were contrasting in reference to. Make sense? Um, if I remember, there's like rules about how many kinds of contrasts you can do and stuff like that, right? If there's like a, a term for that. I forget what it is. Like, you're not supposed to do too many or something. Um, too that. many with the same variable or yeah. too many in the same equation? Um, I can't remember. This was years ago. Uh-huh. <laughs> regression class. Um, but I, I, I don't know if, if does, does that make sense or is that, or can you do as many contrasts as you want? You mean as many contrasts as in like as many <coughs> conditions in that one contrast variable? Yeah, I don't know. I'm gonna to have to go look this up myself. I'm sorry. I should have thought more about the question before I asked it. Okay. I, think um, I don't remember. I want to remember a piece of it too, but you're jacking my memory. So it's not like within the contrast. It's just how many times you can recode the contrast. Which makes perfect sense, I and mean, it's just like then you're just slicing the same <coughs> variable a multitude of different ways. So how many, how many times you can do it to then, say, select the best way to code the variable? I That's guess what I'm remembering. I'm not remembering what the yeah. rule I was this with my dissertation data. There's orthogonal mm -hmm. contrast. Yes, yeah, that's, that's the term that I was thinking. Yeah, right. Where you're dividing the variance in a more parsimonious way or something. 
Well, it's not parsimony. You have orthogonal contrast, you can then independently test up to k minus one orthogonal contrast without having to adjust error rate. And the other thing is if you have multiple, con if you have three variables you're writing effects uh, coding, you're doing coding on, and you end up defining the three variables multiple times, you then have redundant predictors in your regression, and some of them will be dropped out by your smart computer programs. Mm -hmm. So um, basically, if you uh, you know if, if you have a group, if you have grouping variables and writing contrasts that end up defining the groups, and you want to look at group one versus two and three, and group one versus two, and group one versus three, and group two versus three. It's, you only get two of those, and when you start to have redundancy and define the groups multiple times, the computer, the computational routines choke, and the computers now are smart enough to figure out where the redundancy is and drop them. And even if it didn't drop them and you got the uh, weights or the significance for those contrasts, you would have to adjust error rates because you have multiple <coughs> comparisons beyond the x minus y, k minus one degrees of freedom you're allowed. I love having you on there. <laughs> okay. So interaction effects. Um, what does it mean? The relationship between the independent variable and in the interaction term, and the dependent variable is condition, conditional upon the level of another independent variable, right? Said another way, um, the magnitude or the direction and or direction of the effect of variable x on y depends on a specified value, say, of w here. Um, this is the same as saying that w moderates the, ver the effect of x on y. Um, but the converse is also true, right? The effect of W on Y is moderated by X. Um, and some implications are that essentially when you have moderation that you're not specifying, then that means that there's a subset of your sample that's being predicted poorly. Um, and another implication would be the average prediction in the absence of that interaction effect is poorly representing the nature of the effect, right? So your, your main effect um, interpretate your main effect finding is not really all that meaningful because you have these sub these subgroups that could be better specified. So thinking about it just in terms of the equation, here's our original equation. So we've added in um, the multiplicative term for the independent variable and the moderator. Um, the product of x and w makes x's effect on y a function of w, and this is how it happens in the reduced equation, right? Here and here. And that so in that, because of that, the B3 coefficient quantifies how much the effect of a one unit change in x on y itself changes when w changes by one unit. So, and the reverse is also true. So it's... I mean, I, I'm like probably not alone in being confused in interpreting interaction effects, but if you just move slowly and carefully, you can keep track of what's going on. Um, so that's what we're going to do today. So interpreting interactions, simple effects and interaction effects. Here's an example with two dichotomies. So we've got a moderator that is female, um, where male equals zero and female equals one. Um, the independent variable is MI, so we're interested in um, the effect of whether the effect of treatment is moderated by gender. Um, the outcome variable is number, for example, number of drinking days. We've got the equation here, and then with dichotomies, you can, you know, pretty easily keep track of the interpretation of the coefficients. So in this equation, we've got. Um, the intercept being the mean predicted number of drinking days for males in assessment only, right? So that's what the intercept solution would be. Um, X would be the change in Y slope for MI when you're male, right? So that's the effect when you've got one zero. 
W is the change in Y slope for females when you receive assessment only. That's 0, 1. And then the XW, the B for XW, is the change in the effect of MI when you are female versus male. And that's the, the question that we were most interested in, right? So 1 for 1 versus 0, right? 1 as an MI for female versus male. Make sense? Okay. Questions? Centering. Okay, so we had a fun talk about centering before class. Um, so multicollinearity can be, and we will now continue the debate because we have more people, more voices to lend to the, this question. Um, multicollinearity can be introduced in a regression equation when you have an interaction term. Transformation with additive constants has no effect on the magnitude of the regression coefficients. By rescaling the means, meaning centering the variable, you can change the predictor covariances in B1 and B2, but not B3, right? So change the predictor covariances for the two main effects. Um, thus, including the center variables in the model essentially removes the variance in the interaction term, term that is due to the variables that make up the interaction term, okay? So... So, and we, we, when we say centering, there's a variety of ways we can do it, but often, most often it's mean centering, so subtracting that variable minus the mean, right, minus its mean. Um, do people who hear centers versus not centers take a vote? Center, center. And the argument for centering is? Yeah, just getting rid of non-essential multi so right. getting rid of the multicollinearity. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. if a, it's arbitrary which variable you code is positive versus negative, especially in the binary case, in the dichotomous case. Uh huh. So if you have a positive predictor like age, which is always going to be a positive number, then you end up with both both ends up being positive. The the predictor is arbitrarily positive. The dichotomous variable is arbitrarily positive. Mm -hmm. and so with age, if, if you uh, center it, I use z scores, then you get negative. For, the, for one of the diagnoses and positive for the other, and then you get, you get rid of that collinearity effect. <clears throat> I've run it both ways, and it works a lot better when you center. It works a lot better, meaning the meaning you, this get, you get let the measures of like tolerance and variance inflation go way down. Okay. Yeah. Other reasons or thoughts? Yeah? I usually center just for interpretation, so. You know, if the mean of the variable is zero, then my intercept represents something that I can understand. It's everything at the mean of all of my predictors. Uh huh. So for that reason, is and I'm usually looking at growth because I want to look at baseline. So then my intercept is mm -hmm. uh, baseline and stuff. Like that. Right. Yeah. yeah. And th I think it, another, you know, another good rule of thumb is is doing it with and without and seeing how it change the, changes the model. So testing simple slopes at what value of W? Okay, so this is now we've got a significant interaction term, right? And so what are our options in terms of probing that, in, that interaction term to get a better sense of the nature of exactly what's going on? So some examples are you could, um, some options are you could select meaningful values. Values say if you have a, a measurement scale that that uh, describes what it, what it means to be high, medium, and low on that measurement scale. Say, you know, one to three equals low, three to five equals medium, et cetera. Um, you could very often um, folks use just one standard deviation above and below the mean. And you could also use, say, a theory-driven, more of like a theory-driven cut point. So um, maybe there were, say, diagnostic severity cut points or something like that. Um, but what you're doing is you're, uh, when you're creating those, those values, you're looking to estimate the effect of x at those values, right? And if you were doing it in a series of regression models, that's exactly what you would do, is you would run a series of regression <coughs> equations to um, see the effect of x when w is set at that, that value that you've coded it at. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Um, 
downside is that there's often non there are often no non arbitrary guidelines for pick, picking that point. So very often we are using the below one standard deviation and above, and that's just a da data driven approach represented by you know the high, medium, and low in your sample. Um, so another ex another option is something called the Johnson and Neiman technique, and this is in the um, the Hayes process macro. It's also in the his other moderation macros. And what that does is it instead identifies regions of significance. So it shows you um, where X becomes, at what values of W, X becomes significant. Okay? So it gives you um, exactly, and more exact information in terms of the, the nature of the moderation effect. Um, another advantage of the Johnson and Neiman technique is that it can show you when moderation exists at non-meaningful predictive Y values. So often we get moderation, but it's um, it's it's representative of these of sort of extreme scenarios that we wouldn't necessarily observe in practice. Do you need a large sample size for that? It's going to be driven by like one or two weird people. Do you need a really large sample size for that, or is it good will work on small ones? Um, I mean, depending on what you mean by small, I would say for moderation that you want, you know, a decent sample size, at least 100 people. Okay. Um, in terms of the Johnson and Neiman technique specifically, um, I haven't read anything that says, you know, this is like a large sample technique and you should, okay. um, you know, in terms of the... When I, for this, which actually just reminds me of uh, what's in the site for today, which is um, a Hayes paper on, it's probably on Mod Probe, which is like the predecessor to process. Um, so that's in there. There is, I found something that was like a good kind of step-by-step -step in, in interpreting interaction effects when you've centered the predictor variable. So it's like a little handout. It's probably like a UCLA handout, I think. Um, I think that's it. I think those are the only two. Th oh, no, I put, I put the mod probe documentation in there, too. And I'll tell you what that means in a second. So those are the resources that are in there, which actually, like together, is pretty much all you need to do um, to do what we're talking about today. And the Hayes paper is very um, accessible, so it's a good it's a good paper to read. Okay, so Hayes process. I am not I, I am not getting paid by Andrew Hayes. <laughs> I'm not getting kicked back um, on the book, uh, but I'm a firm believer. So I'm gonna, so I teach this class using this macro. The reason that I'm a firm believer is because what it does is it, keep, it creates a routine that, that incorporates a number of complex analyses um, at once, right? So the purpose of a macro is to run a number of, a number of analyses, uh, to automate a number of analyses, and therefore kind of minimize the number of steps that you yourself are taking in running these individual analyses and running them individually, like say, for example, testing the simple slopes, right? Um, Hayes process is sort of the uber macro that um, is the follow-up to all of the individual macros that he has. So he has um, indirect, which is mediation, um, mod probe, which is moderation, mod med, which is moderated mediation, and like a couple of others. Um, and what the what process does is it brings them all together. And in fact, um, the, the macro tests like over 75 models. So um, I don't, he kind of, once he put out the book, took down the documentation for process, but you, you know, what you can do, but I think if you get the book, you can still get it, but what you can do is you can essentially go through the, this book of, of models, which are, you know, a sort of a conceptual model and then a statistical model, and find your model, and that's the sort of the model number that you'll specify in running the, in running the macro. So it's really user-friendly. Um, so who has worked with the Hayes macros? One, two, three? Yeah? Four? 
Um, and experiences, thoughts, opinions. Thumbs up, thumbs down. <laughs> Has anyone been to his trainings on the macro? No? They're good. I mean, and it's, you know, I think it's, I think it's useful. You get a chance to talk to, you get a chance to hear about um, all of the kind of strange things that can happen. I think one downside to, the, to these macros is that you get so much information that it's almost more information than you want. But that's good because it's more conservative because you really know when you're like, it's, you know, like, oh, I've got a significant interaction term, but really it's not all that meaningful of a finding, or I've got mediation, but really it's very weak, things like that. Um, these, you know, using these macros allows you to really diagno diagnose those types of problems a lot more clearly, um, which I think is really good. What about um, people working with, say, like other online tools or other macros, like say the the preacher utility, the preacher um, site where you can you go in and you can test moderation by um, you know plugging like sort of it's essentially like filling in the blanks into a calculator. It'll spit out the information and also give you a figure. You use that one as well. Do you have a preference of one over the other? Well, I use that one because it's. It's I can do three-way interactions in multi-level models, but I don't know if you can do that in the haze or not. So it's right. And you can't do it anywhere else, I don't think. So that's the only reason why I use that one. Yeah, that is certainly an upside to the the preacher stuff is that you get you get a more um, you have you have more options in terms of more sophisticated models. Which brings me to other downsides of the process macro is this is a, re this is a regression framework, this is path modeling, um, and this is list-wise deletion. So um, you, you know, you can, you're going to lose cases if you have any, you know, any missing data. So those I think would be two downsides that I would think of that come to mind immediately. Um, what about experience with like other online tools? I mean, there's like a lot of stuff out there. McKinnon's got a macro or two. Um, there's, you know, there's all sorts of different macros that are out there um, for testing, you know, more sophisticated models. No other suggestions? Okay. All right, so I suggest Hayes. I suggest the Preacher, which is the quant quant -sci site, um, McKinnon site, Ripple, and then uh, David Kenny has a good site to too, although I don't think there's necessarily any macros there. I think it's more just some good conceptual information. Um, what else can I say? Um, what is a macro? I mean, when has anyone just you worked with other macros besides, like, say, Hayes? So just defining a macro, essentially, this is like it's an automatic, automated statistical routine. So when you're using, when you're using it, you'll essentially, um, you'll download it, and then you'll run it, and that will activate it. Um, and then that allows you to then use it, which you will use it with a sort of a, a macro call. So there'll be a macro call, and then you'll specify your specific variables. That are going to be that are going to be used. Right? Does that make sense? How I explained it. You basically just turn it on, and then run it. And when it to run it is really just using that macro call, which is process. Um, so here's here's the example that we're going to work with. The effect of SOMI. So this means a significant other motivational interview versus IMI on month six drinking, so number of heavy drinking days, um, and the question we're asking is does the type of SO, so a romantic partner versus a non-romantic partner, or um, a particular subscale on the significant other behavior questionnaire, um, this subscale is withdrawal behavior, um, affect treatment and process and outcome. So that, that line um, kind of encompasses the broad topic that we're going to talk about today and then we're going to continue next week. Um, the SOPQ subscale, this withdrawal behavior, um, is 
comprised of five items and it's really things like um, I leave the house when my partner well when my significant other um, is drinking um, I refuse to be home when I know that they're drinking it's all just essentially variations on um, avoiding the person when they're under the influences of alcohol as a way to deal with their drinking um, Something also to note about this variable is that it has a moderate to high positive correlation with punishing drinking, right? So having a sort of a punitive approach to the partner's drinking. And that it has a small to moderate positive correlation with supporting, supporting sobriety, which we would con con consider to be maybe a more positive approach to the partner's drinking. And I point that out because this withdraws from person ends up being um, a sort of uh, tricky variable in terms of directionality and thinking about whether or not this is a good or a bad thing. You know, is this something that we want partners to be doing or don't want them to be doing? Is it punitive? Um, <clears throat> you know, from say an MI perspective, we might consider it punitive. Um, but at the same time, is it instrumentally useful? Does that make sense, everyone? Okay, so we're going to work through two examples. So, like I said, there's the macro call. The macro call is just process, right? Process, like this. And then this is just the statement. And this is kind of something that makes you know, that makes it very useful is that in terms of like keeping a record of what you're doing, you're essentially able to like, you know, you have your notation of like, okay, this is dealing with um, say month six outcomes, month 12 outcomes, and then you've got your series of syntax line that keep a good record of the analyses that you've, that you've run. Um, so, so here's the call. The question is, is the effect of SOMI versus IMI on SO follow-up withdrawal behavior? So in this case, withdrawal behavior is the outcome variable that we're interested in. We're looking at this as an outcome, right? Um, is it moderated by re relationship type? Okay, and so this is like an annotated version of that, right? So here's our macro call. Here's our list of variables. This variable is our covariate. Right? Um, you could put it anywhere, but is what essentially what it'll do is if you don't specify the variable somewhere, it treats it, it automatically treats it as a covariate. So here's our variable list, right? We've got uh, month six withdrawal behavior, treatment group, SOMI versus IMI, romantic rel, which is romantic partner versus non-romantic partner, and then baseline withdrawal behavior as the covariate. We specify our outcome variable here, withdrawal variable, uh, withdrawal behavior, um, X as, the, as treatment, SOMI versus IMI. Here's, you see it calls it M, doesn't call it W, so it calls it M even if it's a moderation, well, moderation. Um, so uh, romantic relationship, model one, that's the model number. So it is in the picture, This is model one, pretty straightforward. But this model, this, um, whoops, sorry. This is pulled right from the documentation. So this would be your conceptual model. And then it also gives you a statistical model as well. Okay. Um, co so one is basically yes, right? Um, so coefficient one gives you the confidence intervals for B. Plot one gives you jet predicted Y values at conditional values for um, the moderator. So that is information that you can turn around and put into an Excel file to create a plot. Like with the um, preacher utilities, a, pl an automa a plot is automatically generated. But the downside is it's an, it's an R plot, and so it's kind of ugly. And um, this allows you to do it in Excel, which gives you, you know, more capacity to create like a publication ready plots. Um, 
Simple slopes test, meaning our Aiken and West simple slopes test, or that's what I always refer to the um, 1991 book. Um, simple slopes test is generated automatically. Model two, so this is two dichotomies. Model two is one dichotomy and one continuous variable, right? Same call. This question's different. The question is, is the effect of SOMI versus IMI on drinking, so we've got a drinking outcome, moderated by SO withdrawal behavior at baseline, okay? Um, and so here is the annotated call. This information is all the same. Still model one, Johnson and Neiman equals one, so add that, add that, um, that analysis. And the simple slopes test, the Aiken and West test, is automatic. Coefficient one, plot one. Quantile equals one allows you to create the, the, Johnson, the Johnson and Neiman analysis at observed values of y versus predicted, or values within the range of um, the sample. So and so it, it it constrains you to getting information that might be that is might be more meaningful than um, can often be the case with moderation analysis. And then this mod val command equals x is if you wanted to set a certain um, cut point for the values of the moderator. So the default is the plus or minus one standard deviation from the mean. So is there any questions on that? You're going to go home this week and do this, right? Because look at how easy that is. All you have to do is just plug in your variables. So here's the output. Um, this is dichotomy, two dichotomies. So first, it just gives you your, um, your model, right? It tells you, okay, here's what I did. Um, Here's the outcome variable. Here's the R square value, right? So the total, this is the R square for the total model, right? Um, here are our specific coefficient tests. Um, so the coefficient standard error TP and the confidence intervals. And then here's the interpretation. So here we've got starting intercept for 0, 0, which is IMI non-romantic. This, the romantic predictor, um, tells us that you get romantic partners will give you less withdrawal behavior than non-romantic partners when they're in the MI condition, okay? The treatment group coefficient tells us that SOMI gives less withdrawal behavior when the, not, when the partner is non-romantic, and this is in fact the least, but we, <coughs> I don't know that by looking at this, I know that by looking at the next page. Here's our interaction term. Interaction is significant. SOMI gives more withdrawal behavior when the partner is romantic versus non-romantic. Okay? This just defines our interaction term. This gives us, this is that R square change due to the interaction. So it tells us that we've got not a huge bump, right? We've got about 2% variance explained due to the use of the interaction term. But you can get this when you, if you run multiple moderation models, you can get this for each of the interaction terms, which is kind of useful. Okay. So the top is the simple slopes test, right? So we've got romantic, which is um, the non-romantic partner at zero and romantic partner at one. And then the, the X value and the P value. So you can see that we've got a significant effect. SOMI less, gives us less withdrawal behavior when we've got a, no, a, a non-romantic partner. Here's the data for visualizing the effects. So this is where I went through, this is what helped me to like go through and, and interpret the pre previous page. Um, so IMI non-romantic, that's the highest withdrawal behavior at follow-up, 
which makes sense because they don't, first of all, IMI is not supposed to change the SO's behavior, right? Because the SO never came to the session. Um, they just did the assessments. Um, and if they're a non-romantic partner, they don't live with the person, so it's probably going to be <clears throat> instrumentally easier to avoid them when they're drinking. So we can understand why that would be um, highest. Um, SOMI, non-romantic, is in fact the lowest. IMI, romantic, is at 1.3. And then um, SOMI with romantic partner is 1.4, so it's the second highest value. Okay? Um, these are just notes and warnings. Did lose a lot of cases. In this particular case, the SOBQ got added late, so it actually is associated with pretty substantial, got added late in the study, so it's associated with pretty substantial case loss for this analysis. Um, so that's something to pay attention to. So this is the plot, which is generated in Excel. Um, and so what's the deal? What's the story? When considering SOMI effects on SO's withdrawal behavior from the patient um, due to their drinking, romantic partners are more likely to withdraw than non-romantic partners. That's the story. Okay? This is semi-interesting story, but we're actually going to continue the story next week because really the uh, sort of the ongoing question is like where this is this withdrawal behavior is an important variable, but the question that the open question is kind of like where, where in the relationship is it is it um, best placed? Meaning, uh, you know, how to best understand what's going on. Are we thinking about it as a moderator? Are we thinking about it as a mediator? If it's a mediator, is it moderated by something else, et cetera? So that's what we're kind of like. Um, circling around and trying to figure out this week and will continue next week. Um, so this is just the same information. SOMI produces the most withdrawal behavior when it's a romantic versus non-romantic partner, but the actual, uh, the full most is um, non-romantic partners in MI. And we talked about, we speculated why that could be. So any questions or thoughts? Good? Yes. <clears throat> Oops, wrong way. Okay, um, one dichotomy and one continuous variable. So now we're taking withdrawal behavior and we're treating it as a moderator of treatment effect on drinking. So we're looking at baseline, right? We, we, were, we were treating withdrawal behavior as an outcome previously. Now we're thinking about it as a baseline moderator. The, um, the SO's behavior coming into the study so again, this just tells us our model, right? You can see it automatically assumed that, uh, assigned that covariate, which is the same for the last one. Here's our total model. Um, here is the, um, the coefficient effects. Pretty much the main thing I would look at here is just whether or not we, we should be probing the simple slopes. So should we be probing the nature of an interaction effect? Yes, we should, but it's noteworthy that this is not that great of a p-value. And it'll be noteworthy once we look at the, the next page. That just shows us here's your interaction. Again, here's the R-square change. Okay. So conditional effects. So this is, the, again, the simple slopes test, right? In the preceding one, it was automatically generated. You just had a dichotomy, so it's generated at 0 and 1. Here, you're going to get a default of plus or minus 1 standard deviation from the mean. Um, so what is it telling us? It's telling us that SOMIs will give us less drinking than IMI only when the withdrawal behavior is low at baseline. So again, this is, unfortunately, this is not the most intuitive example, but, you know, what, but welcome to the world of, you know, non-significant differences <clears throat> between treatments and clinical trials and testing moderation and, you know, it's, it's not always fun. 
So um, that's what it's telling us, though. So basically, this is a not this is a non-significant trial, right? So there was no difference between SOMI and IMI. So in that case, you are thinking, okay, well, is there an advantage of one condition or another? under certain conditions. But the risk that you are running is because you have non-significant differences. Chances are the moderation that you might find is not going to be, um, could be, um, you know, not that exciting, I guess is a, a way to put it, right? Not that strong because there's not a lot of a difference to explain in the first place. Um, so again, we, this is, you know, minus one standard deviation at the mean plus one standard deviation. It gives you the effect, so you can look at the sign of the effect. You can look at the magnitude of the effect. You can look at the significance of the effect. Note that it's 059, right? So it's really marginally significant slash non-significant. Um, Oh, okay, so this is just giving you the two values where um, the um, p-value becomes significant, okay? So this is telling us a slightly different story, right? It's telling us that we've got a negative effect of treatment at low withdrawal behavior, right? This is a, a, a five-point scale, and we've got a positive effect of treatment at high withdrawal behavior, okay? which is not something we necessarily got out of this test just because this was forced into um, plus or minus one standard deviation from the mean. Okay? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Like, are we good with this, this like, interpreting this plot or this output? I think it's wonderful because it really just gives you very detailed information about what's going on, which is a lot easier than, you know, trying to interpret the Bs in the, in the, um, the regression output or, you know, running the simple slopes test, which is going to give you this information. Um, but as we can see here, that there's a slightly different story being told by the Johnson and Neiman technique, although still noteworthy that this is marginally, again, marginally, these lines are marginally significant, okay? So really the main, it is mainly at these low values, okay? It's just helpful to be able to really kind of dig around to get a sense of what's going on. Here's the data for um, doing the plot, and here's the plot. So bottom line, what's the story? Is there is an advantage of SOMI over IMI, but only when the SOS withdrawal from the patient due to their drinking is low at baseline. So only when they're not engaging in a lot of this behavior um, at baseline. Mm -hmm. I have a question about, it was on the other page too, low SOMI and high. Do you really mean I am like, isn't that a dichotomous? Yes. Okay, yes. I was going so to use that. So this is IMI. Okay. And this is SOMI, right? This is zero, this is one. Okay. And this must be just, um, I don't know, actually, that, that's probably just bad okay. labeling. Like, I thought it was just your condition. Yeah. Other questions or thoughts? This is the last slide, just, just defining ordinal versus disordinal interactions. Um, I use, uh, Ordinal interaction is non-crossover, so when the lines um, cross within, they do not cross each other within the possible range of the values of the other variable, right? So they do cross each other, they just cross each other <coughs> off of the plot, right? Um, conversely, the interaction is disordinal, crossover, when the simple regression lines cross within the possible range of the other, range of values of the other variable. That's... That's all I have. Um, who's going to go home and test moderation? One, two, right? You can plug in your, your you've got it. I would suggest with, because uh, Carolina sent me some, um, 
some her her model as well and you've got about like five or six potential yeah. moderators I might I would suggest so selecting one dichotomy and one continuous and see what you know so that you can run right with this example okay yeah um, other people thinking of going running home on a Friday night and, and running moderation <laughs> models? Not really running, but... <laughs> Skipping, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, there it is right there for you, just waiting for you to use it.